Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for, for joining. Uh, my name is uh, Tamir Bornstein. I'm the Vice President uh, at EBSCO for SaaS and Open Strategy. And I'll be talking a little bit today about our perspectives on uh, and approaches to uh, open uh, today. So if you think about open, these areas really center on uh, right here at the bottom of the screen, uh, information creation. So here we think about how research is created how it's uh, shared, how it's reused and reproduced, to information consumption, how users access, search, choose and use information, as well as information management, where we think about um, library workflows, how we develop and manage our collections, so focusing more on library uh, workflows uh, specifically. And across these areas, we have different aspects of open. Um, we have open access, we have open science, we think about open infrastructure and open source, and each of these areas uh, seeks to address a specific challenge or solve uh, a particular problem. So if we start with uh, open access, uh, the need to ensure sort of unfettered access to freely uh, available scholarly literature. And we are uh, familiar with many of the uh, initiatives here. I've noted Plan S here out of Europe as an example. Uh, but beyond the need to ensure this unfettered access, I believe you also need to understand open access in the context of indexing the world's uh, scholarly literature overall. And we must, uh, must uh, ask ourselves a fundamental question here, which is how do we collect and surface the most trustworthy, the most meaningful and the most inclusive research, uh, open access and non-open access alike. And when I say inclusive, I also refer to research in different languages from different regions. And we look then uh, not just at the article itself, but also at the underpinnings uh, of research, such as data sets, which is necessary to support uh, the reuse and reproducibility of research. And here as well, when it comes to data and data sets, we also believe we have a challenge that we need to, uh, to address. So this is a study that was uh, published in April 2020 in the uh, Harvard uh, Data Science Review. And it looks at how researchers discover and use uh, data um, that they do not uh, create uh, themselves. Now, the study represents uh, results from a survey. It was conducted with approximately uh, 1,650 or so respondents in over 100 countries, also representing a variety of domains. And I lift, uh, lifted out one uh, particular observation, namely that the greatest challenge uh, that researchers face is that data um, are not accessible, that data are not available for download or analysis. And part of the problem in ensuring uh, access to data is the underlying infrastructure, uh, the applications and the services that we use uh, within our uh, institutions. So this article here on the elephant in the lab blog uh, captures the issues with infrastructure as well, noting the limited uh, interoperability of existing infrastructure precisely because existing infrastructures are tailored to uh, very specific institutional needs. And as a result, the institution, uh, for the institution, the ability to collect, to preserve, to disseminate research, uh, research data uh, certainly becomes uh, difficult if data is dispersed across uh, locations. So I think this also begs the question overall, the institutions and its authors publish works, articles, books, they publish uh, data, and then how then can the library manage these different materials within their collections in the most optimal way? And certainly as we look at the need to include trustworthy uh, information to go also beyond the article and collect different outputs that are generated within disparate infrastructures. And this also brings us to the system, I think, that libraries use to manage their collections, the integrated library system or the library services platform as the platform that can serve as a foundation for many different types of workflows in support of the collection and the dissemination of research. And when it comes to the library services platform or the integrated library system as such, we also have seen different challenges in many ways because of uh, market or industry dynamics. If you think over the last decade, we've seen a lot of consolidation in, in our industry, fewer companies means fewer options. And in essence, we have seen how a handful of systems are provided by a handful of vendors who build solution, solutions within a single, call it monolithic uh, framework or a walled garden. And that approach 
uh, is somewhat outdated considering the modern state of software, uh, where increasingly you have a choice of applications on top of open platforms, uh, which provide more choice and uh, input also for libraries in how to deploy, manage, and also extend the software uh, to support these end-to-end uh, -end workloads, again, in support of, uh, of research uh, overall. So if you look again at the different areas of open and see how and where we can start to address the challenges and look at the questions uh, and that we have seen so far. So if you think about open access, freely available scholarly literature, open science, freely available, reusable, reproducible data code and methods, to an open infrastructure where we think about the availability of interoperable services to better collect, to preserve, to manage, and to disseminate research. And then of course, uh, open source, freely available, distributable, and modifiable source code. Now we often look at these areas uh, in silos, but we can look at where these areas intersect as well. So we can go a bit further and understand the different potential workflows and then slot in solutions uh, to help address some of the challenges that I've looked at uh, so far. So again, if you look at the different areas of open, open access first, and we look at how best to surface uh, the article with a focus on trustworthy scholarly literature. Then for open science, we go beyond the article and look at related open data and other outputs. Uh, think about computational code and research methods that support uh, open science, the reuse and reproducibility of research. Then we can look at how best to connect uh, these applications within an open uh, infrastructure uh, to provide us with the best way to collect, to preserve, to manage, and support the discoverability of research overall, articles and related outputs. And then we have open source where within the infrastructure, we can look at the applications that we use and consider what applications in fact give us most flexibility uh, in how these applications are deployed, supported, and certainly also extended to manage research outputs in support of research, teaching, and, uh, and learning. So if we start with open access here, uh, our approach at EBSCO is and always has been to index the world's uh, scholarly literature. And I think it's important to note here that we treat open access uh, the same as non-open access, really in the following ways. And the first is that we curate the most uh, trustworthy quality content from uh, across the globe. Uh, we, of course, apply our search technology and our underlying knowledge graph. So users can, in fact, find the most meaningful results, potentially uh, across billions of records. And then the last point here uh, looks at the experience on our platforms, where we're looking uh, to provide a modern personalized user experience for how users access, search, choose, and use uh, information, choose and use content. So a little bit of time here that I want to spend is looking at sort of this workflow. So um, we start with sourcing of trustworthy uh, content, as I mentioned earlier, uh, from across uh, from across the globe, and then we load and we index uh, these the content, uh, the research on our platforms. Then we apply our search technology to service most relevant and the most meaningful results uh, for any query. And we're doing a lot of work here to expand also on our underlying knowledge graph, where we map subjects and synonyms to different vocabularies, so users can in fact explore uh, topics across different resources. And then of course user experience. Uh, this is about the uh, user interface, the experiences on our platforms to optimize how users access, search, choose, and use content. And the last point here um, on the right focuses also on integrations. And this is really meeting users where they are and supporting or integrating our search and access technologies across uh, different uh, environments. I think it's also important to emphasize what we consider uh, to be trustworthy content in general. Not just, uh, uh, not just looking at open access. And it's important, of course, because curation is a significant uh, value uh, that uh, we believe uh, is important for, for libraries. And I put up some of the criteria here uh, on the slide, right? Which sources do academic libraries in fact use? Which journals are indexed within key uh, subject-specific resources? Uh, which journals are indexed in citation indexes or included in citation indexes like Web of Science or Scopus? And then which local sources are of uh, relevance to our customers. And again, we apply these criteria to both uh, open access and non-open access content uh, alike. 
But if you look at open access uh, specifically, just some of the highlights, uh, what we currently do on our platforms, and without reading uh, each bullet here aloud, the thing to keep in mind is that we index, of course, uh, content from many thousands of publishers, including many of our partner resources, uh, for inclusion in our uh, research platforms, uh, EBSCO Discovery Service and EBSCO Host. And I've listed some examples here uh, of these resources uh, on the slide. One point here, of course, is also Capel's list, as this speaks uh, to curation, uh, looking at uh, content that is predatory uh, in nature. And our own staff, which are uh, product managers who are also librarians, review the journals to ensure that we in fact agree with the designation. We receive monthly updates and flag also titles for review. And then in terms of indexing, right here in the middle of the column, in the middle column, we index the OEJ metadata, we support on paywall, provide uh, access to different open access collections, including open access monographs, open educational resources, open dissertations and the like. And then the last point here all the way to the right, which I believe is very important, is about the uh, user experience on our platform to support access to and the findability of open access uh, content. Now, this is not only about open access, of course, uh, but a user experience on our platforms, how users engage with content is critically important, uh, as this, of course, speaks to the experience in terms of how uh, people conduct uh, research. So just a few words about this, uh, about this next. So the fundamentals of the user uh, experience, users have grown in many ways accustomed to a certain journey, certain experiences on commercial websites. Think about um, personalized dashboards, uh, sharing op options, recommendation capabilities. Our team is learning from these experiences and also taking an evidence-based approach in our product development, learning from user behaviors, um, understanding data and expectations across our, as well as many of the commercial solutions, and then synthesizing this with expectations specifically for, uh, for the library. So if you think about access, search, choose, and use, um, and these are the different sort of stages of the user, uh, the library user's journey. And as I mentioned earlier, users take similar uh, journeys on commercial websites, Netflix, Amazon, Spotify, Google. So we're not looking to reinvent the wheel when it comes to evolving um, and supporting the experiences on our platforms, both on EBSCOhost and EBSCO Discovery service, uh, service but really looking to combine uh, many different or the many different popular features that we find in commercial websites with the functionality necessary for library users as they do the research and engage with uh, many different types of, of content. So what does this mean? What does user encounter when they get to um, our user interface? And uh, here our platforms focus uh, focuses on the, uh, the on delivering uh, the features and functionality that users have come to expect in a modern environment, personalized dashboard, for example, to manage one's uh, projects, see previously conducted queries, but also easy uh, ways to start research through Wikipedia like research starters, to like items, to have an easy way to use items, to cite an article, to add to a project, to share or download articles within a results list, and so forth and so forth. To highlight a few things in terms of user experience that we emphasize in the journey, uh, in the user journey, also as we looked, as we build out the experiences on our platforms. Now, first, it goes without saying that we support access for any user, including the visually uh, impaired. Uh, then we need to support, of course, standard based authentication and single sign on to make the user experience with the library and its resources as seamless as possible. Examples here include uh, SAML compliant identity solutions, support for uh, open Athens. Then it also goes without saying that you must support cross device uh, research. So users may uh, use their mobile device for an initial search and then continue on their desktop or laptop. So it's about carrying that experience uh, over. And then when we think about uh, integrations, considering that users may start uh, within other environments. Uh, think about the learning management system, uh, such as Canvas or Blackboard or from Google Scholar. And here, of course, it's also imperative that we support easy linking to the full text uh, of an article. OK, so moving on to the next areas uh, of open, and I'm going to be looking now at, uh, at open infrastructure. Because we talked a lot about open access, but uh, beyond uh, open access, we are focused on driving uh, the ideas of open across uh, our services in many different ways. 
So in brief, looking at how we support uh, system interoperability. So on the left, um, I noted a few of our existing services for discovery, the underlying knowledge base, Gobi and EBSCOnet support uh, ordering, analytics through um, a platform called, uh, called Panorama. And we build these solutions uh, for interoperability. Um, and in the middle, I've noted some of those environments uh, that we interoperate with. Uh, Folio for sure, which is an open source uh, library services platform, uh, but certainly also legacy proprietary backend systems. Um, Folio, of course, uh, removes constraints as it is an open community driven uh, platform. It's open source and leaves many options for interoperability with additional environments such as ILL, preservation, campus solutions, other authentication environments, uh, and so forth. And of course, EBSCO is, um, supports uh, Folio and provides services for Folio as well. I think it's important to note here that Folio is open by nature, but it's a key area of focus for us overall uh, that we believe um, is important to bring choice and value to, uh, to libraries. And our goal is always uh, to make sure that our platforms are open for integrating uh, different uh, third-party resources and services. Again, we focus on interoperability and, uh, and choice. And in terms of standards, I also wanted to make a quick mention here that as a company, we are also signatories to the IMS Global Standards First Initiative. IMS is a global learning consortium. It's a nonprofit and member organization uh, that strives to um, enable the adoption of innovative learning technologies. And this is about making st open standards the first and primary choice for uh, education technology integrations. And as I mentioned, we are also signatories to uh, this initiative uh, as well. So now just in brief, moving on to open source and the integrated library system or library services platform in, uh, in particular. So I wanted to sort of look at what we can think of as a traditional representation uh, or um, a, a traditional representation of a library system, of a, a, a legacy library system. And I think you will, of course, recognize this. The traditional uh, library system includes integrated modules with predefined functionality uh, for discovery, for circulation, for acquisitions, for cataloging, for reporting and the like. And these modules are pretty much uh, slotted into one place and they are preset. And the question, of course, is what if you want uh, a system to do more than what these uh, modules offer? Uh, extending or building out functionality in support of research, for example, and doing that is not a given. And if anything, it means that you need to rely on one vendor uh, who created the system to begin with. So if you take this uh, furniture analogy a bit further, uh, what may be more desirable is, just a, is a, a system like this, where you have uh, traditional functions, uh, but where you can extend into new areas and do so readily without uh, dependency on a single provider. And of course, uh, as we think about these new areas, we can consider how best to manage the different types of research outputs uh, that we also, that I briefly discussed uh, so far. So, so this is how, in fact, the Folio project came about. So a result, um, I think, of a recognition, the choice is limited. I talked earlier about sort of the industry dynamics, um, that interoperability and extensibility may be lacking, and that the vendor-library relationship, in a way, had to change to support more choice and to drive more innovation. So what is Folio? Folio is a community-driven library services platform. It's open source, and it's supported by many different vendors, including uh, EBSCO and our partners uh, worldwide. So if you think about Folio or the Folio difference, it's a community of peers who can uh, contribute to and influence the direction uh, of the software. A key approach of Folio is uh, to rely on an underlying uh, architecture, which is a microservices act, uh, architecture. And without going uh, into the details, this architecture allows for the development of smaller apps, smaller applications that can be contributed by different teams, say from different libraries or different vendors. And this is a non-monolithic approach, which can then support uh, more rapid innovation uh, as well. Then Folio has entirely uh, open APIs to support interoperability and choice without having to rely per se uh, on a single specific vendor for integrations. And because Folio is open source, it can be extended uh, in support uh, of research and research workflows. 
So if we look at it uh, briefly at an example of what's possible, if you think of research output beyond the PDF um, and looking at, say, uh, underlying data sets or uh, results, codes, methods, alongside books uh, in the catalog or, or journal articles, right? On their own, each of these are, call them atomic objects that can be used in their own right. It becomes interesting, however, when we can put these objects together, create links between them and deliver objects in a crate, which can then be used as a single resource in teaching uh, as part of a class, for example. So Folio uh, as an open source platform provides us the opportunity to reference uh, objects that are stored in a repository, that are part of the library's catalog or in the inventory or its electronic knowledge base of a subscribed uh, content. And then using Folio, we can uh, look at how we build out these crates in support of teaching and, and learning. So here is just a quick example of a prototype within the Folio open source system, uh, which is uh, something being thought, thought about uh, by a company called Knowledge Integration, which is a company based in, in Sheffield and involved in the open source Folio project. And the idea here is an application that can be integrated in Folio to bring together uh, data from different sources, think of articles, repository data, archival materials, but also research uh, outputs such as code and data, and then within Folio to provide the ability to group materials uh, within crates and leverage these in the learning management in the learning management system or uh, discovery. So I'm going to sort of wrap up just giving a bit of a high level here in terms of our uh, products and services and what we are focusing on as a company in terms of, uh, of open. So for open access, um, of course, support for transformative agreements, our ability to uh, transact these for libraries, but also to ensure uh, continued access to trustworthy and diverse information. I talked about this at the beginning of this presentation. This is about uh, curation of uh, research of content and a rigorous process that we employ to ensure that we in fact index quality research uh, from um, across the globe. We're also focused on what we call, what we call content and platform innovation. Uh, our efforts here focus on the underlying search technology, leveraging of subject indexing to uh, ensure precision in research, expanding uh, our underlying knowledge graph where we connect subjects and concepts, supporting natural language uh, searching, uh, and the evolution, uh, the continuous evolution of the user experience and supporting that uh, evolving user experience on our platforms, uh, through our user uh, interfaces on uh, both EBSCO Discovery Service and, uh, and EBSCO Host. And this is looking again at how users access, search, choose, and use uh, information. For uh, open science, uh, sorry, for open infrastructure, our focus here is to deliver uh, integrations and support uh, the interoperability of um, the EBSCO product suite and our search technology with uh, within external applications, uh, different services, third-party services and environments. And a good example here is integrating discovery with the learning management system, but other examples include integrating uh, discovery, uh, such as EBSCO discovery service, of course, with platforms like um, Alma or w WMS, but also looking at integrating our ordering platforms, say uh, Gobi with Alma or EBSCO net integrations with Alma through EDI to support uh, different ordering needs. And a lot of work here uh, focuses on developing, developing and extending our uh, APIs. And the last point here for open source is our support for open source software and specifically for Folio that is uh, open and interoperable and provides libraries with a community of peers and more choice in how to deploy and manage, uh, manage the software. I want to add sort of a few sort of key uh, takeaways uh, in terms of our solutions um, and how we think around, uh, around open. And these are the principles that I've outlined here on this slide. Uh, certainly equity matters. So as we look to provide access to the world's scholarly uh, literature, whether it's open access or traditional, we must provide access to the breadth of research for any user uh, from any background and in any language. Uh, the second uh, principle here is that of choice, ensuring that applications are interoperable and that libraries can choose and implement those applications that in fact best serve their users. And the middle here is versatility, sort of creating a flexible environment across solutions to support different integrations and customizations. 
with that, I would like to thank you very much. I've noted my email here uh, on the slide. Please feel free to reach out anytime with uh, any questions that uh, you may have. Thank you very much.